Hello, I'm Steve Barsick Amstel with High Tech Design Safety. We're a third party certification, test, and design lab here to provide you support to get your products and hardware to market. This is the second part of a mini part series about product safety, and right now we're dealing with semiconductor equipment safety. The first chapter was about the overview of Semi S2 and how it applies to your semiconductor manufacturing equipment and related equipment. This section is going to talk about the various parts of Semi S2 as just an overview to give you a sense of how um, all encompassing Semi S2 is. So when I go through this, I'm going to pause and give a short brief statement about each of the sections. So let me go ahead and use the document so that I can get these straight. Okay, first off we start with purpose and scope and we spoke about the scope during the last session. There's some limitations and reference and terminology and then we get into the safety philosophy of the standard. Now the safety philosophy of this standard is a lot like the philosophy I helped create with Texas Instruments back in the 80s. Our goal there was to design out, to engineer out all the hazards that we could and generate a, um, a culture of zero exposure. So, um, and also do that practically and reasonably. We didn't want to, you know, engineer out every single hazard on the planet, but we did want to engineer out the hazards of the processes and equipment that we were working with. That's really the philosophy of Semi S2. Let's engineer it out. If we can't engineer it out, let's control it in a way that it still doesn't impact the operators. And then from there, let's provide interlocking and safety systems and other devices to control that further. From there, if it still can't be designed out, then we're going to have to rely on procedures, processes, controls, labeling, and documentation. Those are still reserved for things with fairly low risk. And that's the safety philosophy. Um, there's some general provisions in Section 7, which talk about how you provide the reports and what goes on and everything like that. Uh, section 8 talks about the evaluation process and what you would expect there. So in Section 8, we talk about um, how the evaluation pr should proceed, uh, what reports might be provided, and other information there. Um, we'll help you get through that process and make it practical and easy as possible. You know, this is a very complex standard, and you're building very, very complex equipment typically. And um, we want to make this practical and easy for you to get through. Number nine talks about documentation provided to the user. So these are the manuals, uh, the installation manuals and documents, um, your operator manual, your service and maintenance manual. If you provide those or if you require factory people to do the service, they're still going to need the documentation in order to service the equipment. From there, um, section 10 is hazard alert labels. So in Semi S1, the related standard to Semi S2, it talks about the format of these hazard labels. And we have a couple of other videos about hazard labels and warning labels and things like that that you can look up. And when we get to section 10, we'll do a detailed dive on that. Section 11 is about safety interlocking systems. And the key point you want to get about safety interlocking systems is you have to use safety related, compo safety -rated components and safety rated relays. Um, for very low hazard type things, you might be able to use normal off-the-shelf electromechanical parts with high levels of reliability. But when you get into something that is a hazardous process, you'll need to be sure that you use these safety rated components. And we'll talk more about that when we get to that section. Well, I'm going to do two more sections on this video, and then I'll re do the remaining 14 on the next video. The next one is 13, electrical design. Electrical design across your semiconductor manufacturing equipment is very, very crucial. You need to meet all the local and global codes for your equipment. And however, there are also some specific things in Semi S2 you've got to meet. The goal here is design to 
design all of those requirements in from the beginning. And then the last one for today on this video is section 14, fire protection. So um, in fire protection, number one, we want to design out the fire hazards. Number two, we want to provide, if required, by a risk assessment, um, detection of any fire hazard. And of course, if you provide that detection and it detects an over temp condition and over uh, a detect smoke or, or something else, UVIR, that's part of a fire, you'll want to do a tool shutdown. Then the third part of that is any fire suppression equipment that you want to include with your equipment. That uh, fire suppression equipment will have to meet all the codes and standards. And it'll also have to be compatible with whatever you're trying to put out. So for example, let's say we're using pyrophorics, we don't want to spray water on them. Or that we're using some kind of other chemical, we have to be careful with what fire suppression materials and processes we're using there. Some of the other important things about fire suppression and detection equipment are that they need to have high availability and uptime. So let's say you turn the system off for a short period of time. You want that fire suppression and detection system to remain uh, energized, active, and available should there be a fire while the machine is temporarily off. So those are the first 14 sections of SEMI-S2. We'll cover the next 14 in the next video. If, you're like, if you like these videos, we ask you to click the like button and the subscribe button. And if you have any comments or would like to get in touch with us, please do. My name is Steve Barsick Amstel from High Tech Design Safety, and we're your go-to for third-party certification, testing, and design.